In this video, we'll learn about numerical differentiation. This video is split into two parts. In the first part, we'll derive some finite difference equations using the Taylor series. In the second part, we'll do a couple of quick examples to illustrate the application of the formulas we derive. Alright, let's see how the Taylor series relates to numerical derivatives. The essence of numerical differentiation is to compute the nth derivative at a specific point, xi. In your calculus classes, f of x is given to you as some sort of analytical mathematical function like y equals sine of x or y equals x cubed. But when it comes to numerical methods, we're usually given a data set instead with no knowledge of what the underlying function is. This is incredibly prevalent when you work with hardware. For example, suppose water is flowing out from a reservoir. You might have a sensor which measures the height of the water in the reservoir once every tenth of a second. If you differentiate the data, you can obtain the water's flow rate, which is an important quantity in fluid mechanics. But how exactly can you differentiate it if you're not given a function? Well, we can use the data points we have. This means that the accuracy of our derivative is contingent upon how much data is available. The more data points you can use, the more accurate you'll be. This is a huge problem in numerical differentiation. Sometimes, you might not have enough data points to produce a sufficiently accurate answer. Other times, you might have so many data points that you might need to resort to a less accurate numerical differentiation scheme in order to reduce computation time. We'll explore these trade-offs throughout the calculus unit. I've mentioned the Taylor series a couple of times by now, but what exactly does the Taylor series have to do with numerical differentiation? If you recall, the Taylor series can be used to predict the value of a future point given the current point and some derivatives. Let's rearrange that a little bit. If we can get the future value from the current value and some derivatives, it stands to reason that we can calculate the derivatives given the future and current values. If we have a discrete data set, then we actually know the value of the future point and the current point, so we can use the data to estimate the derivative. Let's say we have n data points. The point of interest is xi and its y value is f of xi. The point in front of xi is denoted xi plus 1 and its corresponding y value is f of xi plus 1. The point behind xi is denoted xi minus 1 and its corresponding y value is f of xi minus 1. The distance between xi and xi plus 1 is denoted delta xi plus 1 and the distance between xi and xi minus 1 is denoted delta xi. For all n points, the spacing may not be uniform. Delta xi may not necessarily equal delta xi plus 1. If we take the Taylor series expansion about x equals xi, we get the following formula. Hopefully this looks familiar. We estimate f of xi plus 1 as the y value at the current point, plus the spacing times the first derivative evaluated at xi, plus the spacing squared over 2 times the second derivative evaluated at x equals xi, and we can keep going forever since the Taylor series expansion is an infinite series. Obviously, we can't implement an infinite series in MATLAB, so we have to truncate it somewhere. Suppose we stop expanding after the first derivative term. As you know, truncation errors arise from using an approximation in lieu of the exact mathematical procedure. When we stop expanding, we introduce some truncation error. We replace all the terms we truncated with this sort of placeholder variable called O, which stands for big O notation. Big O notation represents the relative amount of truncation error. This statement does not read O times delta xi plus 1 squared. Rather, it reads O is a function of delta xi plus 1 squared. Kind of like how we say y of x is not y times x, but y is a function of x. It means the truncation error is proportional to the square of the distance between the current point and the point in front of it. The square comes from the fact that we terminated the expansion after the first derivative. This term has a zero with derivative, aka no derivative. This term has a first derivative attached to it, and we stopped when we would have introduced the second derivative term. Anyways, we're left with f of xi plus one equals f of xi plus delta xi plus one times the first derivative. If we rearrange these terms to solve for the derivative, we get dy dx equals f of xi plus 1 minus f of xi all over the spacing. This is how we can numerically compute the first derivative. Note that this formula uses the current point and the point in front of it. Because we use the point in front of the current point, this equation is called the forward difference. 
Note that the truncation error becomes on the order of delta xi plus 1, not delta xi plus 1 squared. This is because this term technically contains a zeroth order derivative, aka no derivative, attached to it. It's kind of a hand wavy explanation, but the important point is that the truncation error of the forward difference is proportional to the step size between the current and the future point. If you cut the step size in half, the truncation error will also be cut approximately in half. But if you double the distance between the points, the truncation error will about double as well. The Taylor series can be expanded backwards to calculate a previous value on the basis of a current value. The process is the same. If we truncate all the terms after this dy dx term and rearrange what's left over, we end up with this equation. This is called the backwards difference because it uses the current point and the point behind it to estimate the first derivative. The truncation error of the backwards difference is also proportional to the step size. It turns out there's a third way to approximate the first derivative. The forward difference uses the current point and the point ahead of it. The backwards difference uses the current point and the point behind it. It would be nice to form a derivative estimate which uses both the preceding and succeeding point. We can start by subtracting the backwards difference equation from the forward difference equation. When we do so, we end up with a bunch of messy algebraic terms shown here. We can pull out these two dy dx terms, so we're left with the y value at the future point minus the y value at the previous point equals the step size between the current and future point minus the step size between the current and previous point multiplied by dy dx plus these remainder terms. After some more rearrangements and some more hand wavy math, we arrive at the central difference formula. The central difference states that dy dx can be estimated by taking the difference in the y values in front of and behind the current point and dividing it by the total x distance between the future and previous point. If the data is equally spaced, then the denominator just reduces to 2 times the spacing between each point. Note that the central difference does not actually use the current point in its calculation. The Taylor series analysis yields the practical information that the central difference is a more accurate representation of the derivative than either the forward or the backward difference. It has a truncation error on the order of the square of the step size. If we have the step size using a forward or backward difference, we would approximately have the truncation error, whereas for the central difference, the error would be quartered. We've done a lot of math so far, so let's summarize the most important points. Let's say we have a data set and we want to estimate the first derivative at a given point. We can do so three ways. We can use the forward difference, which uses the given point and the point in front of it to estimate the first derivative. We can use the backward difference, which uses the current point and the point behind it. Or we can use the central difference, which uses both the point in front of the point of interest and the point behind the point of interest. The forward and backward difference are typically less accurate than the central difference. These formulas can be used for both equally and unequally spaced x data. I will say there are more accurate schemes for unequally spaced data, but for the purposes of this class, these formulas suffice. Let's examine the special case where the x values in our data set are evenly spaced. This means the step size between the current and the future point and the step size between the current and previous point are all the same. It's common notation to replace the step sizes with the letter h. This doesn't change the truncation error of the methods, it's just a simple terminology change. Keep in mind that the denominator of the central difference fraction becomes 2 times h instead of just h because the x distance between the future and the previous data points spans two step sizes, not one. A picture is worth a thousand words, and this one is no exception. It can be hard to interpret the three differentiation schemes just from looking at the formulas, but I think this plot summarizes it nicely. Let's say our point of interest is this middle data point here. To estimate dy dx using the forward difference at the middle data point, we draw a line joining the middle data point and the rightmost data point. The slope of this line is our derivative estimate. To estimate dy dx using the backward difference at the middle data point, we draw a line joining the middle point and the leftmost point. And to estimate dy dx using the central difference at the middle data point, we draw a line joining the right and the leftmost points. Note that we actually skip over the central point entirely, which is reflected in the central difference formula. I drew the analytical first derivative here. We can see that the forward difference underestimates the first derivative, whereas the backwards difference provides an overly aggressive slope. 
The central difference is a great meeting ground between the backward and the forward differences. It actually looks fairly close to the exact dy dx. This agrees with the notion that the central difference is generally the most accurate of the three methods. It turns out that if the x data is equally spaced, the central difference is just the average of the forward and the backwards differences. The shape of the function determines whether or not each scheme over or under approximates the derivative. dy dx at the middle point is positive, but gradually becomes zero as the function reaches its crest right around here. Therefore, the forward difference underestimates dy dx because the function doesn't change as rapidly with increasing x. Meanwhile, the derivative is really steep from the middle point to the leftmost point, so the backwards difference will have an overly steep slope as a result. This is just a cool tidbit on how the accuracy of an estimate is influenced not only by the actual values of the data points, but also by their geometry. Here's a slide explaining big O notation a little more formally. I'll skip this one for now since I've kind of beaten it to death so far, but the key takeaways are that the truncation error in the forward and backwards difference is proportional to the step size, whereas the truncation error in the central difference is proportional to the square of the step size. It's possible to derive numerical differentiation schemes which are way more accurate than the ones we've covered so far. We can do so by combining multiple Taylor series expansions about other points. I'm not going to do an example of this just because it's time consuming, algebraically difficult, and just generally not worth it for this class, but I want you to be aware that you can make more accurate approximations by using more data points. I hope my claim that using more data decreases the truncation error is intuitive. This formula I wrote here is the third order forward difference which uses the three points in front of the current data point. The truncation error is on the order of the cube of the step size. If you have the step size, the truncation error would be cut by approximately 8. One of the chief concerns of using very high accuracy schemes is the computation time. This formula requires you to do 6 more operations than the regular forward difference method. We have to multiply the first two terms by the coefficients, negative 11 over 6 and 3. But then we also have to tack on these two additional coefficients to the additional points we include f of xi plus 2 and f of xi plus 3. In total, this gives us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 more things we have to compute just to get our dy dx estimate. This can really bog down your computer if you have a massive data set, so more accuracy isn't always viable. Perhaps the biggest concern with any differentiation scheme regardless of accuracy is the amount of available data. Let's take the central difference as an example. To compute the central difference at a point, we need the point in front of and behind the current point. This means we can't use the central difference at the last data point because the point in front of t equals 4 does not exist. We also cannot use the forward difference at t equals 4 for the same reason. The central and the backwards differences cannot be used at t equals 0 because both methods require the point behind it, which once again does not exist. When we numerically differentiate, we typically use a combination of all three schemes to account for the boundaries. We use the forward difference at the first data point, the backward difference at the last data point, and the central difference for all the data points in between. This gives us complete coverage of the entire data set. The last theory related thing I want to discuss is the importance of having a relatively clean data set. When the data to be differentiated is obtained from experimental measurements, there's usually scatter in the data because of the experimental errors or uncertainties in the measurements, such as electrical noise. The data shown in this figure contains quite a bit of scatter. If we use a forward difference starting from the third point and progressing through the data, large variations will be seen in the value of the derivative estimate from point to point. It's obvious from the data that the value of y generally increases with increasing x, which means dy dx is positive. But the forward difference keeps flipping from a positive value to negative value to positive value and a negative value and so forth. You can smooth this out by using a scheme like the central difference, which is more accurate. If you do have noisy data, you'll probably want to clean it before you differentiate it. We've done quite a bit of math, so let's make things more concrete with some examples. Here we have a five element equally spaced data set. Suppose we want to compute the forward difference at t equals 1. For the forward difference, we need the point in front of the current point, so we need to use a data point 2, 3. We divide the difference in x values by the difference in the t values, which comes out to x of 3 minus x of 2, all over t of 3 minus t of 2. 
I kept this in MATLAB notation since we're going to be implementing this in MATLAB in the future. x of 3 means the third element in the x vector, which is 3, not the x value corresponding to t equals 3, which would be 3.1. Likewise, t of 3 means the third element in the t vector, which is 2, not t equals 3. When we plug in the numbers, we get 3 minus 2 over 2 minus 1, or 1 meter per second. Recall that the mathematical formula includes the O of H term, but the O of H term is just an abstraction representing the truncation error. When it comes to actually using these formulas, we just ignore the big O notation. Now we want to compute the backward difference at the same point, t equals 1. The backward difference requires the point behind t equals 1, aka the 0, 0 data point. This means we do x of 2 minus x of 1 all over t of 2 minus t of 1, which returns 2 meters per second after we plug and chug. And here's an example of the central difference at t equals 1. Now we need both the 2, 3 data point and the 0, 0 data point. Remember that we don't actually use the 1, 2 data point, even though we're estimating the derivative here. We do x of 3 minus x of 1 over t of 3 minus t of 1, which gives us 1.5 meters per second. Note that this 1.5 is the average of the estimate from the forward and the backward differences. Once again, this is because the data is equally spaced. Throughout this video, we've only covered first derivative estimates. What if we wanted to estimate, say, the second derivative? All we need to do is incorporate more terms of the Taylor series. Here's the formula for the backward difference Taylor series expansion. We originally truncated the expansion after this dy dx term, but we can truncate after the second derivative term, then rearrange the terms we kept to obtain the second derivative estimate. We can combine it with the original backward difference formula to replace the dy dx term, and we will eventually obtain an expression for the second derivative estimate. Once again, this isn't really that relevant to this class, but be aware that truncating the Taylor series later on can help you get the higher order derivative estimates. This really only works with uniformly spaced data though. Instead of doing the hard math yourself, you can use what's called finite difference tables. Finite difference tables list out the coefficients of each data point you need to compute the derivative you want. This table here, which I shamelessly pulled from Wikipedia, illustrates the coefficients for the central difference. If you want the first derivative with a truncation error on the order of the step size squared, you multiply the point behind of the point of interest by negative half and multiply the point in front of the point of interest by positive half, then you add them. This is equivalent to the formula we obtained in this video. This particular table lists all the way up to an eighth order estimate, which requires four points behind the point of interest and four points in front of the point of interest. We won't use these tables in this class, but you might want to keep this in the back of your mind for future use. When it comes to high order or high accuracy differentiation schemes, the formulas can get messy really, really fast. As an intelligently lazy person, I prefer to use codes people have already written and validated. In particular, the diff xy function is one of my favorites. It's not written by me and it's not a built-in function, I found it on MATLAB's global file exchange. It's a really handy function that's specifically designed to differentiate unevenly spaced data. I would download it just for the sake of having it. You never know when you'll need to differentiate some data at an internship or something. I actually used the diffxy function extensively in my own research to calculate some second derivatives. And that's about it. To recap, we derived the forward, backward, and central difference schemes. Each scheme requires some data points, and the accuracy of each scheme is contingent upon the data points you use. In general, the central difference tends to be the most accurate of the three. If you want to increase the accuracy of these three baseline schemes, you can reduce the step size and or redo the Taylor series expansion about other points. When you implement these three schemes, keep the boundaries of the dataset in mind. For example, you can't compute the forward difference at the last data point because the forward difference needs the points ahead of the last point, which obviously doesn't exist. Finally, if you ever need to compute high order or high accuracy derivatives, you're probably better off using validated functions like diffxy. This video was pretty theoretical, but the upcoming videos will feature more number crunching and it will give you a better glimpse of implementing these differentiation methods. See you next time.